Good morning, brothers and sisters of Cities Church. Uh, this is for Thursday, June 4th. Again, our text is 1 Corinthians 10. And uh, let me start with Psalm 119.23, which says, Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. And I think what's so significant about that is that even when this psalmist is in crisis, even when he's being uh, attacked, even when others are plotting against him in that circumstance, and there's the pressure to push the Bible aside, he says, no, I will meditate on your precepts. And I, what I'm taking away for me and, and for us as a church is that, that in these embattled days of crisis, we need all the more to meditate, to linger, to steep our souls without hurry in the very words of God. So resist the urge to read one more, two more, ten more news articles in such days of crisis in our own city and do so in such a way that would neglect God's word. We need God's word all the more. We need all the more unhurried moments in his word in these days. And so we move on to 1 Corinthians 10. And as we've seen, uh, probably no book in all the Bible covers as many different practical topics as 1 Corinthians. It's hard to get a, a clear sense of the outline because it's from one topic to the next. And as we saw at the beginning of chapter 8, a new section began after the teaching on marriage in chapter 7. And now chapter 10, where we look today, uh, it continues and concludes that section that started at 8.1 with now concerning food offered to idols. The truth is, as we saw in chapter 8, verse 4, that an idol has no real existence. Yet, Paul says in verse 7, chapter 8, that some through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. And so Paul is calling the church there in love to consider the weak conscience of others. And then we saw yesterday in chapter 9 that Christian maturity is not just exercising personal freedom, personal rights without regards to others, but Christian maturity is being free enough in Christ to forego so-called freedoms, in an effort to love and care for others. And so in chapter 9, Paul puts himself forward as an example. That's how he gets into all this talk about his rights. And he says he foregoes his right to be paid as a worker of the gospel, and he foregoes that right for the sake of winning others. And there's, there's a deep joy in this for the Apostle Paul. There's a deep joy in this for us to learn joy of not making use of our rights but to forego them for the sake of gospel love. Mature Christians aren't fixated on their rights, but they're stable enough, they're strong enough to forego their rights to care well for the needs of others. And then chapter 9 ends in this interesting way about Paul uh, disciplining his body. And the end of, in the end of chapter 9 adds something important. In not exercising our rights, we are also not only caring well for others and loving them, we're also disciplining the appetites of our bodies. And so there's this additional grace that's given, additional joy that's given in being the kind of people who would give up our rights for the sake of others. We're not only helping others, we're preserving ourselves in doing so. And this is what Christian perseverance looks like. Christian perseverance is not coasting. The Christian life is not coasting. The Christian life is not a pattern of indulging our flesh. God calls us to self-control, and he gives us his spirit to produce self-control in us. So there's 8 and 9 now leading to chapter 10. And chapter 10 continues with where Paul ended that last section of chapter 9. It's a kind of call to check yourself. So I think there's three main sections here in chapter 10. The first, verses 1 to 13, is a call to check yourself. That follows up in that last paragraph of chapter 9. And probably verse 12, I think, is the main point of this section to begin chapter 10. Verse 12 says, Let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And so we should all check ourselves. There's a danger in moving from the exercise of one right to another. And the emphasis on Christian freedom is that are we building up calluses in our hearts? Are we, are we not disciplining ourselves? Are we pushing self-control aside in that process? And here in this first section, there's two amazing truths to mention in verses 1 to 12. Uh, the first is how amazingly the Old Testament is for Christians. That's verses 6 and 11. 
Verse 6 says, These things, talking about what happened in the Exodus generation, these things took place as examples for us, Paul says to Christians. And then verse 11, he says, These things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So, brothers and sisters, it is an amazing thing to have this book from God. Not only is the New Testament for us, the Old Testament, all that's been written down, these things happened, he says, and these things were written down for the church, for us, that we might be encouraged, we might be strengthened, we might have hope, we might endure. And the other thing to mention here in this section is verse 10, and the severity of grumbling. Paul says, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, he says, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. So this is significant because grumbling is so in vogue in our day. We have to work to be humble. We have to work to be hopeful. Increasingly, the course of this world is cynicism and grumbling. And we saw this in Exodus chapter 16 here uh, back in the fall. And this is not the only place in the New Testament that emphasizes starkly, very clearly, a sober warning against grumbling. Philippians 2.14, James 5.9, 1 Peter 4.9. So grumbling is significant. It's one of those uh, respectable, acceptable sins that we overlook so often in the church and in our times. And so here's a, a warning sounded against the severity of grumbling. Then the second section in chapter 10, verses 14 to 22, it's a call to be careful about our associations, that we not be participants with demons, Paul says in verse 20, because when we eat of the Lord's table, when we associate with Christ and with the church, we have one particular public association with Jesus, and we should be careful of our other particular associations, whatever those things are. So the, the kind of causes that we identify with, or employers that we identify with, or teams, or patterns, or uh, whatever groups we might identify with apart from the church is something to consider. Are we associating with demons in those, uh, those associations? Then finally, the last section here. This is verse 23 through the first verse of chapter 11. And you might summarize this section as, do all to the glory of God. And so now ver this section at the end of the chapter brings us back to where we started this section in chapter 8, verse 1. And in particular, verse 24 says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. That's a summary of what Paul's been getting at here from the beginning of chapter eight. It's like Philippians 2, 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Don't be so fixated on your rights. Christian maturity moves beyond personal rights and personal freedoms to forego those freedoms for the greater joy of caring well, loving others, bringing the gospel to others, winning others. Now let me end here with verse 31 in context. Verse 31, most famous verse, maybe in all of 1 Corinthians. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all the glory of God. And it's, it's important to see this verse in its context because we quote it a lot, and rightly so, out of its context. But in the context here, as we've seen, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, he's talking about the foregoing of Christian freedoms, making those hard decisions. Do I do my preference here or do I give up my preference for the sake of somebody else? And I think a really helpful, practical truth to draw in, as Paul does in verse 31, is, is this to the glory of God? The glory of God calls us into something bigger than our own personal desires and our own preferences in the moment. And in Christ, we have been set free from self-focus and self-preoccupation. And we are free to consider others. And consciously considering the glory of God helps us both to live for the good of others and for our own deepest and most enduring joy. When we make the decision to forego personal freedoms in the moment, to live for the good of others, we're also doing that for the sake of our own joy. There is a unique joy in foregoing freedoms for the sake of love, and we're choosing something that will give us a deeper and more enduring joy by making that choice in the moment for the glory of God. As we close here, verse 32, it's one thing to be faithful to Christ and to end up offending others, but it's another thing to aim to offend. It's one thing to seek our own advantage, and it's another to seek the advantage of others 
that they may be saved. And so Paul sounds that warning in verse 32. And then he ends, chapter 11, verse 1, ends this section that began in 8.1. Paul says, be imitators of me. That was all of chapter 9. He was putting himself forward as an example, but he doesn't end with himself. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. He ends with Jesus. This is what Jesus did. He forewent his rights. He did not live according to personal freedoms in the moment. Being in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And God saw it and God rewarded it and highly exalted him. And so too he will for us who are willing to get beyond the immaturity of focusing on our own rights and privileges and freedoms and having the stability, the strength, the maturity like Jesus to give ourselves to the cause of love for others.